The chair Good notes the time. Sorry. The chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call the meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Tammy Parks. Here. Mr. Dylan Maxfield. Here. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. Ms. Sarah Marshall. Here. The quorum is present. Also attending is tonight's public hearing is Mr. Rob Wachella, the planner for the town, and we anticipate Mr. Rob Mora will also be joining us. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, the Special Permit Granting Authority, of the Amherst, Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted in mails to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. And they may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the CBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they, so, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen or by um, dialing nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed by the board or to the board, excuse me. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide, up decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has, stick, has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file the decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until a written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20-day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in the Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, um, consideration of minutes and approval of minutes from uh, the meeting of April 27th, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-13, BWC Eastman Brook LLC, request for a special permit under section 3.340.0 of the zoning bylaw to construct an 18 Point eighty seven mega MWAC seventy five point forty eight megawatt battery energy storage facility with associated site improvements, including stormwater management system, access road, sixteen foot high sound wall barrier, vegetative buffer at five fifteen Sunderland Road, map two A, parcel thirty four, RO residential outline, RLD slash FC residential low density farmland conservation zoning districts. This is continued from April 27th, 2023. Public meeting to follow and discussion by the members of the board. General public comment period on matters not before the board tonight. Other business not anticipated within 48 hours in adjournment. The first order of business is the consideration of minutes from our last meeting. Um, I have reviewed the minutes. I have found them to be um, accurate 
and I wonder if anybody has any uh, any changes or modifications. If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the April 27th, 2023 ZBA meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. The, minute, uh, the vote is unanimous, five to zero. The minutes are approved. Rob, those are really good minutes. Um, yes. I really appreciate that, the work it takes to do that. And uh, it's pretty impressive work. So, and it really helps, it does help to, um, to remember exactly what we did the last meeting and to refresh our memory of uh, before we take up this um, a continued application like this. So thank you very much. No problem. And uh, if they, I want to ask one question of the board, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Uh, so do the minutes seem like they're at a good, they're not like too overbearing for people to review? Because I know it's gotten to nine pages and I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't too much for the board to, to look over before a meeting. I can condense them for future meetings if that's preferable or if the board's okay with the minutes as they are. I mean, the last hearing, the last meeting that this covered had a lot of information that was discussed. So I had to capture a lot of it, but um, I don't know if you guys are okay with me doing it this way, I'll keep doing it that way. But just keep in mind if permits moving forward aren't as detail oriented as this one is, they might be shorter. I, just, awesome. I think this is fine. This is fine. I mean, I I found them to be very detailed. Um, perhaps you could do less, but I would err on the side of uh, the detail. And then if we find that it's, it's too much or you're too overworked, you can mm -hmm. come back and we can revisit it. Awesome. Great. Very good. Uh, the first order of business in the public hearing on is on ZBA FY 2023-13. BWC Eastman Brook, LLC, Request for the special permit under section 3.340.0 of the zoning bylaw to construct an 18.87 MWAC 75.48 megawatt battery energy storage facility with the associated site improvements, including stormwater management system, access road, 16 foot, foot high uh, sound barrier wall and vegetative buffer at 515 Sunderland Road, map 2A, parcel 34, RO, residential outline, RLDFC, residential low, low density farmland conservation zoning districts. This is continued from April 27th, 2023. Are there any um, additional disclosures since our last meeting? If not, um, we did do an additional a second uh, site visit on May 15th, was it? May 10th? Yep, we did a second time. site visit. Um, at that time, we the purpose of that was really to, the principal purpose was to see the out the footprint of the building and the the sound wall uh, laid out on the property. So we observed that. We met we met with the uh, uh, the engineer. We observed that. We walked around the site. Uh, we walked the the um, we walked along the the. Um, limits of the the boundary of the, of the building and the, uh, the sound wall, the sound barrier. The following questions were asked, um, would some of this, the trees on the site remain? Is the grass outside of the project, will the grass outside of the project area be left undisturbed? What's the distance from the vehicle gate to the end of the access road? Uh, will it be 150 feet? With the second gate on the southeast portion of the site only for access by foot? Why does the southern portion of the site have a zigzag shape to it? It seems to limit the amount of battery racks that could be located on the site. And lastly, would the applicant consider working with local artists to construct a art mural or some other kind of art on the sound barrier wall? Um, I think those pretty much adequately um, reflect the questions we asked and what, what we did. Um, does anybody want to add anything to that? All right. Just that, it, just that uh, it was very useful. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. It yeah. was very useful. Yeah. So we appreciate yeah, really the did. effort to stake that out again. And it really did help to, to get a sense of how the 
project sits on that property. Uh, Ms. Parks. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure. Did you say that we were hoping that they would save uh, trees that were able to be saved? I did not mention that, but we did discuss that which trees would be saved. Yes, we okay. did. And we asked them which, and we expressed a desire to save as many as possible. Okay. Good catch. I also want to note that uh, Rob Moore, the building commissioner, has joined us as well. Um, so this, the next order is to review the submissions. The submissions since our last meeting um, are most of which are outlined in the draft project application report include, first of all, um, I'll refer to that, they're in red. So we have new site plan or updated site plans, which are dated 5-12-2023, which includes sheet one through five, existing conditions, proposed site plan, sediment and erosion controls, site details, additional site details. Yes, extension uh, uh, sound barrier details, which was submitted on 517. And um, those are the ones listed on the project application report. In addition, we have a letter dated May 17th from Mike Zimmer of Blue Wave responding to 16 questions and requests from the board. We have an updated emergency response plan dated May 17th. We have details of a sound barrier. We have a construction schedule. We have a rendering of a site, the structure and the sound barrier. And we have the document from the staff entitled research for the 525 2023 ZBA meeting. Um, I think that's everything, is it Rob? And did we have, and I know did no public comment um, that was made on this or submitted to the, to the um, to ZBA or to the council on this? No, not for this project. Okay. All right. So um, next order of business is to hear from the applicant. Um, so I guess what the most, the most valuable thing to be would be to go through those responsive questions that we uh, left at the, from the last meeting, which we sent to you in the last meeting and your response to those. Um, and I guess, jo Josh, are you gonna represent the, will you identify yourself and your um, address for the record? Yes, this is Josh Larsey from Blue Wave. Uh, Blue's address is 116 Huntington Ave, Boston, uh, Massachusetts, 02116. Great. So is that is that how you wish to proceed, um, Mr. Larisi, is to go through that letter of the 17th and give us more detail, or do you wish to go somewhere? That, do you have other plan for your presentation? No, Mr. Chair, that, that works perfectly fine. I was just planning to pull up our letter on the screen, uh, go through each of those responsible by one, and uh, just open up to the board for questions or clarifications on any of those those responses. That, that sounds great. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, board members, um, and Rob, thank you as well. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess we should specify Rob, <laughs> the, uh, the building department and Rob the planner. Um, thank you all for your time. Uh, so I'll share my screen now. Um, as Rob mentioned, uh, we submitted a number of materials, including responses to board questions and uh, requests from our last meeting in public hearing. Um, so I'll go through those my one. I also have the, the plan up as well, the plan that I can reference for any of these specific notes or requests. Um, I can go through them all and then we can go through, go back to any of the, the responses or questions to clarify or if there's additional follow-ups the board wants to discuss. Um, Got it. So the first one was uh, the board requested an updated project uh, projected construction schedule. Our initial submittal was an outdated schedule. We did submit an updated schedule uh, with, that should have been in the board's packet. Um, they showed the estimated start of construction through completion um, at this time. Um, so uh, I'll have to answer any questions on an updated schedule. Um, there was a second request that we uh, show on our plan, all proposed above ground and underground connections. Uh, the site plan has been updated to show that um, within the, the site footprint. Um, so you can see uh, everything, I'll zoom in more, everything here labeled UGE, underground electric, um, as well as the above ground connections here coming off of uh, 116, or excuse me, off of Sunderland Road. Uh, OHE is overhead electrical on these poles, proceeding to underground for a portion of the site, then overground again. Uh, before underground back to the inverter pads. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll emphasize that those are conceptual, of course. Any, uh, you know, 
prior to construction, we'd be submitting a, a fully uh, a fully issued for construction plan set to be signed off by an electrical engineer, uh, and that would be submitted to go in for review and sign off. Um, there was a request for updated site rendering specifically to ensure that all the utility pole locations were correct, uh, as well as to include signage uh, on the site showing where uh, blue, you know, the name of the project and clear identification of Blue Wave, as well as uh, any warning signage. Uh, so we did submit updated site renderings with those corrections. Um, and the signage we put on the sound barrier itself, we're happy to, you know, if there are any suggestions or preference the board has in terms of location of signage on site, um, if there's preference to have it out closer to the road or, or on the wall near the access to it. Um, there was a, the, the next request, the board asked for a copy of the degradation plan that the manufacturer would be okay with being made public. Uh, we were unable, unfortunately, to, to obtain permission at this time to share the exact uh, degradation schedule. Um, I'm happy to give a little bit of color here just generically as to the expected degradation. Um, so the, the uh, degradation does generally proceed in a somewhat linear fashion over the 20 years, uh, 20 year expected 20 year life of the batteries. The first one to two years is a larger amount of degradation in the batteries uh, than subsequent years um, uh, for just based on the underlying chemistry of the battery cells themselves and the usage, it just, works out that they tend to degrade faster in those first two years. Uh, but after that, those years, you would, we would expect it to degrade fairly consistently and linearly over those years. Um, and that would result in an augmentation schedule where we're typically going to look to install additional battery units to, again, what we'll call just top up the battery capacity, um, uh, probably once every eight, you know, eight years or so is when we would, we would look to install additional units. So, I'll point out again, and I'll flip over. Um, so that would refer to these additional units and in, uh, in hash lining here uh, that would be, you know, a portion of them installed around seven to eight years into the operation of the system. And then another seven to eight years, there would be a couple more. Um, and again, that's just to keep the capacity of the overall system uh, at our initial uh, megawatt hour level in order to meet our ISO New England capacity obligations. Uh, so, I'm happy to, you know, put that right into the board as a condition, kind of when we expect the, the augmentation to occur. Uh, and of course, you know, we're, we're happy to submit um, whatever we can prior to building permit being issued. Uh, they would be final at that point. And I, I, after I get the rest of the responses, if there's more specific concern that any board members have on this specific item, I'm happy to discuss that. Um, if there's something we can address with a condition or um, prior to the issuance of any building permit. Um, the next comment uh, was just to arrange the follow-up site visit. Uh, as the chair recapped, uh, that occurred with our project engineer, Drew Bardakis, uh, and I believe to the satisfaction of the board. We did, uh, there was a request to update the emergency response plan with as much information as we can at this time, uh, including reaching out to the Sun Island Fire Department, including their information as well. So we did submit an updated and new iteration of the emergency response plan. We did add in a variety of additional information uh, that we can confirm at this time. Uh, as I outlined in, or we outlined in our response, this plan will remain in draft form. And there is information in there that really won't, doesn't have an opportunity to be finalized until equip, final equipment selection is actually uh, concrete. We have uh, an issue for construction plan set, and we're able to have our trainings with the fire department and establish some more specific, <clears throat> excuse me, specific information regarding, you know, muster safety points, uh, any final coordination with the fire department regarding equipment or uh, for certain procedures. Uh, so what we would suggest is just, uh, again, and that that plan will remain quote unquote draft until the project is fully built. Uh, ESRG, who's our safety consultant helping us on this plan, they would go out to the site and conduct the final site visit once the system's built. They would make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be per the plan, uh, and they would conduct that site visit with the fire department. And at that point, a final emergency response plan would be issued for operation of the site. Uh, so we would just request a condition from the board that uh, that that plan, uh, basically an updated plan, be submitted prior to issuance of the building permit. Uh, and then um, basically, we could also potentially consider a condition where 
prior to issuance of maybe CMC um, from the from the, the town to actually once this is built, but before uh, we get a certificate of completion on construction, uh, we ESRD has that site visit and we issue that final plan before that's that uh, COC is issued. Um, Can I just get a clarification from you, Mr. Larson? What is COC means what? Oh, sorry, excuse me. So uh, from the building department perspective, a COC would just be a certificate of completion. Uh, typically, we completion. Can, yeah, completion, um, uh, as opposed to compliance, which we'll have to also separately get from the conservation. Um, so that would be mean that before you turn this, in, in effect, before you turn the switch on, that the fire police and the building departments all have signed off on the emergency response plan, the final emergency re response plan, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, additionally, we did reach out to the Sunderland Fire Department. I spoke with uh, the Sunderland Fire Chief over email, uh, informed them of the project, its location, uh, Cineverse uh, information, including the site plan and the, the emergency response plan at this time. They didn't have any comments or input at this time. They did emphasize that they would like to be included in any pre-construction meetings uh, and trainings that we would coordinate with the Amherst Fire Department. Uh, so I, we, we responded that we would be happy to include them in any and all meetings and trainings, uh, and we'll continue to do so uh, leading up to and through construction. Uh, the next request from the board uh, was just regarding pollinators, uh, our inclusion of them, whether they can be included in the plantings list. So we did update the notes on the plan to ensure that uh, any seed mix that's utilized for site stabilization or after site work has been uh, completed will include pollinator friendly landscaping species. Generally, we also do have that landscaping planting list for the visual screen. Uh, generally speaking, there's a number of species on there that are already pollinator friendly. There's a number of flowering uh, shrubs uh, and trees. So uh, effectively that list is already pollinator friendly in regard to the visual screen. Um, and we'll, again, we included that note to ensure that any seeding mix or ground cover mix uh, would also be a pollinator friendly mix with some kind of uh, you know, flowering species, perennials, native flowering. The next comment or request from the board regarded, uh, was in regard to the installation of bollards on the site plans uh, or some other acceptable way to reinforce the sound barrier. Uh, basically the, the concern here is a potential collision with the sound wall from uh, specifically a vehicle and what kind of assurances or providing evidence that it's, that won't jeopardize the integrity of the sound wall or the, the equipment within the site. Uh, our response here is just based on the current design of the site. We, we don't believe the installation of bollards is necessary. We are uh, undergoing Mass DOT review on this site. We've submitted our site plans to Mass DOT uh, for an access permit, which is required uh, due to the change in use of the site. Mass DOT has provided comments on our site plan uh, so far, they haven't indicated that they see a need from a safety or engineering perspective for any additional barriers uh, along the highway. Uh, generally, we do we do have some experience, uh, folks at Blue internally working on projects, specifically solar, that are along uh, the Mass Pike and, and along some other Mass DOT routes that are pretty close to the highway where tons of high-speed vehicle traffic occurs. Generally, they don't require any additional barriers uh, until you get within, I believe it's 10 to 15, or maybe 15 to 20 feet of the edge of the highway. Um, and our sound barrier is approximately 100 feet away from the edge of Sunderland Road. Additionally, there is also the Mass DOT drainage ditch that's along the side of the road. Uh, so the only way a vehicle can actually, or would be able to enter the site at any speed without hitting that. Uh, utilize one of the two points of access through the, the semicircular existing driveway. Uh, so we, we do feel comfortable with that there's not a threat to the sound wall from a from a vehicular impact given the setback and that ditch and mass DOT's review. Um, if the board still has a concern that that's not adequate or, or they'd like to see more, um, we're we're happy to also entertain including followers in the site plan. It, it's not um, it, it's something we, we can do. So if that's still a concern of, of the boards, we can we can add those to the site plan as a condition. Uh, the next request was just a con, uh, considering the addition of lights and cameras to the site for added security. We did include callouts for lights and security cameras at the proposed access gates on the northwest and southeast. 
So we would install those. So there would be some additional presence there uh, from a security perspective. The next request was in regard to the O&M plan. Uh, and specifically, there were references to biannual maintenance that was occurring uh, and whether or not that was meant to be biannual. So every two years as opposed to semi-annual twice a year. So we did correct those that it was intended to be twice a year. So we did correct that own and plan uh, to refer to the, that specific, those specific maintenance items as semi-annual. There was also a request to update the own and plan, ensure any contact kind of information and references are up to date and accurate. We did review it. Everything is up to date and accurate at this time. Uh, once the project is closer to construction, we'll have finalized uh, operations and maintenance contracts with regional technicians and, and maintenance groups. Uh, once we have those in, in hand, we will update uh, and furnish to the board and the building department any finalized uh, operations and maintenance plan and contacts. So we're, we're also happy for a condition here that prior to building permits issued, that that final main operations and maintenance plan be submitted. Uh, and that contact information is verified uh, that those will be the, the technicians to respond to the site in the need of maintenance. There was a request from the board to consider making a sound, sound barrier wall a, a darker green color to help it blend into the surrounding landscape. Uh, we were, Blue is happy to accommodate this request. We would just suggest a condition uh, in, in a, a potential approval that the sound wall be that dark green color or some other color approved by the ZBA prior to entrance and building permit. We ask for that flexibility just in the event that whatever final sound barrier uh, construction and, and contractor we utilize for sourcing the material, just in the event there's not a specific shade that's exactly say a dark green or we can find some other agreeable color that the board finds uh, acceptable um, that uh, blends in uh, well enough into the surrounding environment. The next request was uh, the addition of signage to show specifically the company name, Blue Wave, the type of facility and other uh, information from the management O&M or emergency response plan, uh, and then include those in the site renderings. We did add additional signage details to the site plans. Um, so those are on the detail sheet. So we did add an additional oh. high voltage sign, and we did update the signage detail for the for the project sign itself, specify that it is Blue Wave. It's our uh, the Amherst battery energy storage system, uh, and then the 24-hour emergency contact number. Uh, so, and those were included on the site renderings as well. Uh, again, we would, as with the, some other site details such as these, they can change our construction. So we would again request the condition that uh, the board review and, and sign off on any final signage uh, prior to entrance of the building permit. And again, if there's a preference from the board in terms of putting the signs out on the road or on the sound barrier close to the system, we're happy to accommodate the board's preference. Uh, there was a comment on, uh, I think, of a site visit is, as to whether any trees that are currently on site will remain after construction. I'll reference the site plan and I'll zoom in here. So it can be a little tricky to see. So this this uh, symbol right here, this references an existing tree. So there is an existing tree here. It's hard to see here, but there's one right where my cursor is, if you can see it underneath where the proposed gravel access road is. And then there's the a larger existing tree uh, further to the south. Apologize for the slow scroll. Right here, just just uh, east of the southeast of the access road entrance. So currently, those these two trees to the north would be have to be removed as part of the construction. They are smaller trees um, currently compared to one of the southeast. Uh, as of right now, we would not propose to disturb or remove the tree to the southeast as it's outside of the limit of work. Um, and of course, if somehow the design changes to where there somehow we the footprint of the system shrank uh, or some other some other need arose it meant that we no longer had to take up as much space we would do our best to try to to reconfigure the site to uh, not disturb these two trees but this time we would be proposing to remove those two trees and leave the one to the south uh, intact the next item relates to a question as to why the southern portion of the site had this sort of zigzag shape to it uh, and what's the reasoning behind that? And I'll illustrate here on the site plan. So that refers to 
basically the southwest portion here. The snow bear comes in and then cuts in here, comes down, cuts again. In general, the battery systems themselves also kind of the, the equipment pads zigzag down toward the southeast portion of the site. The reasoning behind the specific layout, a number of factors. So as you can see, or maybe not so easily see on the site plan, there's obviously a lot of underlying buffers and setbacks we're trying to respect with our site plan. So we have the wetland buffers, the riverfront buffer of the east. We also have generally the, uh, I, we try to respect a 100 foot setback from all property lines uh, in accordance with, or I should say in accordance with NFPA, but per NFPA guidelines on remote systems. Um, so generally speaking, we, and then also uh, there's a, a mapped flood, floodplain uh, boundary to the south as well. So all those factors constrict our site in multiple ways to create this kind of unique shape. Um, and then on top of that, generally we just want to keep it as tight as possible to the containers, reduce our footprint as much as possible, while also making sure we meet the minimum clearances we need from the fence line or the sound barrier to the battery equipment itself. So there's, there's setback distances we have to achieve there. Uh, and really it just ends up resulting in uh, this sort of zigzag shape. So for example, you know, we could, and then a further, further comment as to, well, why don't you just make it a regular rectangle, add more batteries. There's also from the uh, grid perspective, there is a limit to how much capacity we can have. So I think I mentioned at the last hearing, but I'll, I'll reiterate here again as well. Uh, we are, we have studied this project at 18.7 megawatt, uh, or applied for 18.87 megawatts with Eversource. The project cannot go above that. So even if we, even if those wetland buffers weren't here, we were able to expand the site footprint beyond where it is today, uh, it would be to no, no use to us because we wouldn't be able to put any more battery units in the current proposed. So, uh, so that's really this exact shape just results out of these various site, site setbacks and factors. And then basically just trying to keep the footprint as minimal as possible to fit that capacity we need for the 18.7 kilowatts. Uh, and then the uh, final question or a comment that arose, I believe, again, at the site visit, uh, just would we consider working with any local artists for uh, any kind of art mural or installation on the sound barrier wall? Uh, we're happy to, we're certainly happy to, to work or, or talk with local artists about um, a potential sound, uh, art installation on the wall. Uh, from our perspective, we would just, just want to first make sure there's no uh, conflict that could arise with any sort of electrical, fire, safety code, uh, just visibility of the wall, uh, if, if that could cause a concern if, if, if the art mural or our installation would somehow obscure that. But um, certainly from our perspective, we that sounds like a great idea and we would we would really appreciate the opportunity to add something like that to the, the local uh, landscape of, of Amherst. So, uh, so I, I don't think it's, it's not something we can commit to, uh, or we can we can certainly commit to exploring the the possibility um, at first from a code perspective, and then also uh, in connection with local artists. But um, I just wanted to say that Blue Blue is happy to, to look into that as a as a possibility. Um, and that was uh, the, our responses. So I'll stop there. Uh, if board members have any specific questions or clarifications they'd like to have answered on any of the specific responses. I have a couple of questions and then I'll open it up to the rest of the board members. Um, so I, I, I found the model of the, the signage. Um, where do you propose those, those signs to be affixed? Are you looking at a monument sign that's out in front or are you affixing them to the, the sound barrier? Um, I, in the site renderings, we're proposing to fix them to the sound barrier. We could certainly put them as a monument out by the road. I think it would just, that's where we would, defer to the preference of the board. Uh, I don't think we would have a preference either way and we could uh, we could accommodate either either design. Let me just say that if you, if you put it on the sound barrier, you, you run the risk of the, the trees blocking it so you can't see it. Um, and it does, it lends um, sort of less, it lends more credibility to the site that is it's not something odd if there's a, a monument sign out in front so people won't go by and say what in the hell what is this let's go investigate or what is this it, no, it's it's out there it's obvious it's open so i would 
we should we can consider what the rest of the board wishes, but I would encourage you to 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 have a sign out in front, or maybe that's a condition we can discuss. But as opposed to just pet, putting it on the sound barrier. Um, we, and we could do both. And when I was running, yeah, you can do both too. Yep. Uh, when I was running through the um, emergency response plan, I think I saw a couple of references to a chain link fence, and I didn't see that on the. I, there's not a chain link fence on the site plan, is there? Yes, apologies. So there, there was initially before we incorporated sound walls. So there's reference in the emergency response and a chain link fence. That would just be a reference that's outdated, and I apologize for that. So we can okay. we can have that, that reference that you know for the, a modification. A okay. To make sure that's updated. Got it. Um, another question I had was. In thinking about the security of the sound wall, I think the con I think the concern is that if the sound wall was breached and a vehicle or the sound barrier crashed on one of the battery storage units, what would be the danger to the community? I mean, it's the one downside is that you would you lose the production of that battery storage system. That's you know that that would be too bad for you guys, but it's not a public it's not a public um, danger. But I guess, is there any danger of fumes, emissions, anything that we would worry about if there was a breach by somebody running a truck through the sound barrier and into the battery storage uh, modules? What would happen? Sure. So if there was, say, a collision with a, a battery cabinet and there was uh, cells or units within the battery cabinet or, or enclosure that were damaged, um, so the UL 9540 test, 9548A testing that occurs for all large scale lithium mount systems, they do similar tests at the cell level to see what happens. So they'll do, for example, a nail puncture test to see does the cell have any exhibit any kind of elevated thermal conditions if there's some physical damage or, or a rupture of the cell. Um, typically, if, if there, there is some kind of physical damage, that could cause some elevated thermal conditions to the underlying cells within an enclosure. Uh, and then from that perspective, we then defer again to the UL results of, okay, if there's a, a, a cell or a number of cells that are compromised in the system and had some kind of term, elevated term conditions, what risk does that pose in terms of spreading or propagating throughout the system? And that's where we fall back onto the design of the system from a UL perspective, UL and, and, and FPA 55 compliance perspective to ensure that any conditions that are arise with any one or, or multiple containers, those don't themselves cause a propagation or spread of, of fire or thermal conditions to other containers. Um, so it, there there could it could cause a localized event maybe within a closure that's affected, uh, but we would not expect it to spread or cause a wider scale event throughout the system. Um, that being the case, again, we're, as I mentioned, we're in mm -hmm. is a concern with the sound barrier. Um, we're happy with you know a very flexible condition uh, for for decision in terms of how that's protected again. So uh, we're happy to include bollards along the the front portion of the wall. Um, NFPA has specifications on spacing and the design of those bollards, and we would follow that. Um, and uh, or you know as was mentioned in the the board's request and comments, uh, we could do something that's either. Bollards incorporated in the site, or as was mentioned, uh, some structural analysis that shows that that wall would stand up to a collision of a, of a vehicle. So we're, we are we are certainly more than willing to enhance that and add an extra layer of security to to that that concern. Um, but we wouldn't expect a collision to cause some wide scale event uh, throughout the system. So because the of the the thermal runway, I guess is what you were talking about from last meeting Correct. you would have you'd have some kind of thermal event amongst the um, within the cell or cells that are struck you you say it's unlikely that that would spread to other s battery cells that for lack of a better term and and you didn't you didn't say but there's there i I guess I would ask, is there any release of any toxic chemical or gas that would come from that, that would endanger the public? And I think we, when we talked about this last meeting, there was not, but I just wanted to re reaffirm that. Sure, so um, 
if there were a fire caused, then you know, just as with any modern structural or plastic yeah. fire, that fire could have you know that smoke that comes out of that fire could have you know or does have pollutants, uh, you know, something you don't want to breathe in necessarily. It's going to be again because it's not going to propagate. That fire, you know, would would in theory be limited to just just that enclosure that's affected. Mm -hmm. So when it's spread throughout the system, uh, and um, and likely it would be if there is a fire and there is smoke created, um, that smoke would only be created for a, a shorter period of time. Uh, you know, typically uh, what's observed during most of these fires, uh, they're, when they occur is that the majority of smoke production uh, or gas production occurs within the first, say, 20 to 30 minutes of, of, a, of an event or fire, uh, and it drops off quickly after that. So, um, so we wouldn't expect, you know, that to cause, yeah, so, uh, a wider concern for public safety in the area, or excuse me, the area, uh, from a from a gas emission or, or smoke emission standpoint, um, and again, yeah, we're happy to, you know, again, prevent provide mm -hmm. more against that. So, and one last question, then I'll open up to the rest of the board. Um, I didn't notice any cut sheets for the lights that you were going to um, propose. And you, I'd like you should probably do that. You should do that before you get your uh, final site plan in. But I want to. They should be, they have to be a uh, dark sky compliant lighting um, as per our rules. And, and I don't, I don't think there's a condition that states that. And if there isn't, we might have that. I think we would include that in our conditions, but they have to comply with, um, you know, downcast. You're not really going to have trespass on nearby property, I would think, because they're, but downcast to, you know, to keep from uh, uh, light pollution. Uh, and for nature and birds and everything else. Yeah. Um, those are my yeah. quick. So you're, you're, you're fine with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'd, we'd be happy to commission to yeah. comply with all Amherst, dark sky and, Amherst, and other Amherst regulations on lighting. All right. Questions from other board members. Ms. Marshall. I have uh, two topics. So, so since we were just talking about the signs the warning sign well maybe three <laughs> um if so one of the signs is high danger high voltage if it really is a hazardous uh to the to trespassers i would suggest putting those signs on all sides of the uh of the structure um just because, you know, who knows? There are people farming in the in the field to the east, and I don't know. If I mean, if it really is a hazard, I, I think more than one sign would be would be wise. Um, bollards. I also uh, I wonder on the east side, which is next to the farm, the the field. Um, if that is right. I, I, my recollection, I may be wrong, is that's very close to the property line or or the 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 limit of what you are leasing. Um, I just wonder if you might consider putting, especially since there are no plantings along that east wall, to have something to protect that wall from the farm equipment that may be turning or or doing whatever whatever is done. Um, but that's really more protecting your asset, I think, than um, than against any um, danger to the public. Um, but then, thirdly, I'm confused, or rather, I think there's inconsistency between the site plan, what we're looking at right now, and a rendering. And so maybe I misunderstand, but I'm looking at the access road that then curves and goes through the wall. So those ovals to the west of that access road, those are plantings, the ovals and the circles, yes? Correct. Okay, all right. So this shows that those plantings hug the wall until that access road, and then they're on the other side between the access road and the highway, right? Okay, that's not what we see in the renderings. Right, so, so, so here they're depicted, basically the access road separates the wall and the plantings on the rendering there, the, the plantings are directly against the wall. So which, yes, so which which do you intend to build? <laughs> uh, yeah, 
that sorry, and I apologize for that inconsistency. Um, I would say we we can build uh, either one, and, and again, it would be a preference of the board. I think we look to bump it out on this side mainly to have that access clearance uh, to the wall, so we could have um, also just put the the planting a little farther out to the road in that area provides a little maybe better screening uh, at least along that side. So. Um, we could go either way and, and put the plantings as they are on the more toward the south directly adjacent to the wall. Um, uh, we will have to, it, it would get tighter here. So the plantings might just be more limited if they're directly adjacent to the wall. So we don't cut into too much into this drainage ditch and then the access road itself. Um, or we can we can keep them on the other side, uh, which would probably, which would enable us to do a little bit more. So um, happy to defer to the board's preference in terms of uh, from a design perspective, I would say we're um, ambivalent to either option. But if it's if the board views one way better than the other, from a visual perspective, we would work for the option. I would say aesthetically, I like what's on the site plan. Um, but there is a difference. I mean, I guess I'm not sure anyone can see me at the moment. But on the rendering, there's a lot more gravel or just just hardscape. And so you would be giving some of that up. This is doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, there's just less less gravel or dirt for vehicles to be driving on compared to what's in the rendering. So if that's acceptable to you, the site plan, that's it is what I would prefer. But unfortunately, it's one with the renderings, just the process that our consultant who uses the renderings when they have to adjust to. When they import the topography from Google, Google Earth and the way they kind of adjust the to represent different ground conditions, I will say the rendering shows. I think it's it's uh, aggressive in how much of that, like you're pointing out, gravel in that in this area is shown. So I would say what 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 the site plan. I would refer to the site plan in terms of the actual extent of say gravel features on the on the road. So even if these plantings weren't here in this area, this wouldn't be gravel. We would leave it as grass or undisturbed as possible. If possible mm -hmm. okay but if, but, yeah, but if you would prefer you know we'd be happy for be a condition as, as like a plan modification or not, i shouldn't say plan modification maybe just a condition just you know that the the, the vegetated screen as proposed matches the site plan um or matches the site plan dated and submitted um and uh is installed that in that area across the access road okay Thank and then you. yeah all right. Go oh, ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say to answer your other two questions, I uh, certainly agree with, yeah, good. I think it's a good idea. We can include signage along all four sides of the system. So if anyone's approaching from any direction, they could, they would see that signage. Um, and probably along the eastern boundary, we might put it signage two places. Um, and then Bollard's, it's a good point as well on, on the potential farm equipment that might be operating in the eastern portion of the site. Um, so if, if uh, you know, we'll, we'll, revisit that with the landowner if there is expected to be any heavy machinery or farm equipment operating that eastern portion then uh we would you know we're, we're again also we can install bollards or some other protection along the eastern boundary um and if that's that can also be a condition acceptable to us with the board that you know if there is going to be farming farming machinery any heavy machinery operated on site while the system is in operation that there is protection uh, provided Right. I mean, you can always, one can just drop big rocks. <laughs> you don't have to set bollards in concrete and, over, you know. Be something, over. yeah, far yeah. more than sure. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have one more little one, but I could wait. If Go ahead. Prepare. All right. About the, um, you mentioned the emergency response plan and that you'll be, you know, you can't finish it until your construction, during, well, it may be until you've actually installed everything. Um, and you'll submit it to the two fire departments. Um, I'm not sure what the what what is normal, but do you do you ask for a sign off from those two fire departments that they you know that that contains all the information they think is necessary for them? Sure. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. In this case, I think our procedure would be present that plan to the fire department. Uh, or, or rather go over the, the the whatever that iteration of the plan is at that time, uh, ideally final. 
Uh, and yeah, basically, I don't know if they would need to say sign it, but we would we would want to make sure they've reviewed it and don't have any further questions or concerns about it. And yeah, if that's in the form of a uh, written or email sign off from the fire departments confirming yes, you know, we've reviewed the plan, we've we've undergone training on the plan and been to the site with the consultant to visit it and and understand how the plan relates to the site as built. Uh, and then they are comfortable with that plan and and how what they're supposed to do in, in any kind of event. So yeah, so we would propose a, a simple confirmation from the fire department to the ZBA or the, or the building department, uh, or rather, yeah, the building department. Uh, once that's done, I think would we'll, we'll work on our end. Okay. The, the condition as drafted in the draft requires submission to the fire department and and the police to, uh, the, to the fire and police department, and mm -hmm. also submission to the so plan shall be reviewed by fire and police and submitted to the building commissioner for approval prior to the issuance of a building permit. And then the, the final one is later on. And I would think we'd need the same process before this, as you called it, the COC or sort of this. I think of it as certificate of occupancy or <laughs> in a residential way, you know, but before you flip the switch, my my intent would be that before you flip the switch, that the emergency response plan has been approved by the um, building commissioner and or fire and, and uh, police. And I can't imagine the building commissioner would approve something that the fire and police have reviewed and found um, wanting or, or um, insufficient. Right. So, That's my concern that submitting yeah. it is one thing, but knowing that it's acceptable is, is another. So, so Rob, Maura, is that um, is your understanding that it, it comes to you, you you defer your judgment about safety to the fire and the police, or is, is you work this through cooperatively or collegially, or what? How do you deal, deal with that? So these are actually done joint inspection uh, as a team, uh, yeah. and it, it's electrical, uh, fire, and building inspectors together uh, before any final, uh, you know, final completion or approvals are granted. Everybody is in agreement. Uh, most of the inspections uh, at key points are are done jointly like that. Um, you know, structural and other inspections, electrical inspections may happen independently, but uh, certainly by the end at a final, it's all all done together and all the inspectors are communicating about it. Okay. So if we have, you have to be the person to approve plan the sufficient um, input has been received from fire and from police. Yeah, that makes sense yeah. because yeah. we actually we actually process the permit applications for the fire yeah. department through our office and transmit them over to to their uh, fire inspector. So uh, that that's the way we would prefer to uh, yeah. function. Good. Great. Rob, the other Rob, <laughs> I see your hand up. Rob Wachilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I kind of wanted to go back earlier about um, Ms. Marshall's point about vegetative screening. So um, essentially what they have listed on the site plan for location of plantings, they have to honor that because they're basically building and constructing everything to the site plans, plus any minor additions they might do after the fact before getting their building permit. But I would recommend to the board that they should, if they want to instill a condition specifically stating that vegetative planning shall be designed as such in the site plan, just to reiterate your point. And also um, in terms of the ERP, uh, after discussing with Mr. Moore about this uh, a week ago, uh, they don't have to physically sign off on the document itself per se, but it is wise for both fire and police to review it and then given to the billing commissioner at the same time that they submit their final site plans. That could be acceptable as well. Um, that's all I had. Um, Ms. Parks, I think you had your hand up. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, thank you for your detailed answers for everything here. And I just wanted to say, you know, I was the person who suggested the dark green color and I don't wanna add any expense to your project or anything else. You know, if the soundproofing wall only comes in brown or, you know, whatever color, you know, I wouldn't wanna make it a condition that you paint the wall if it's if it doesn't 
if it's not readily available like that. I'm just, my concern, my concern is I don't want it to look like a penitentiary. So a more, more natural colors, uh, less industrial color. Um, but I, but again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote no because of the color of the fence. No, I appreciate that, and and like, and certainly Blue Wave also has an interest, and we we want this to to blend in as much as possible as well, and, and not not stand out. So, um, like I said, we're, we're happy representing that we'll we're, we're, we'll pursue the color that blends in most naturally into that environment, which yeah, like as you point out, likely a dark green color. Um, and then like I said, we're we're happy to just at the time of the sound barrier construction, um, or rather procurement for construction, we can simply identify what colors are, are available and consult with the, the, the planning department um, or the board as to here are the colors available, um, which one is the one the, the, the board or town would prefer, um, and we can, can go about it like that. All right, thank you. Are there other questions? From the board, Mr. Larry, I had one. I, I I've been I've driven past this a couple of times, and um, and it was meant, and I do think it was really helpful to be able to walk the site with the um, with the flags out, so we could see where how it actually physically sits on that. It's really helpful for your engineer to do that. But one thing I was thinking about is the you're you're not proposing landscaping around the front of the building. Um, you know, the time, the space between 116 and the, um, the oval driveway uh, or on the left or the right of that as you're facing from with your back to 116 and you're facing the facility. But there's a lot of, it, it's just kind of um, tacky grass that's there. It's, it just doesn't look very good. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't want, I'm, I don't think it should be, a, I'm not looking for a golf or anything like that. But it just, I just know that it's going it, to, unless it's kind of managed, it's going to look pretty gonna look kind of lousy. What is your, you have a real landscape plan that involves any of that. What is your plan for that? Willing to put some kind of, you know, work to have uh, native grasses or nat other native species and removal of some of the invasive species that are obvious as you drive down 116. I'm not worried about behind it. I'm not worried about the, I guess it's the north and the south ends, because I think those are all, mostly those are the water districts. You can't touch anything in there anyway, but just some of that area out in front. Um, the rendering has some grasses growing up a lot of different places, but that's, uh, uh, I think that was part of the glitch of Google Earth. So tell me what, you're, what you'd be interested or willing to think about for just making it look a little bit nicer or being more native plant friendly so that we do have some benefit to the the landscaping that's there sure yeah um yeah absolutely i mean generally as a as a principle we we tend to any area we we don't need to touch we try not to more as a, mm -hmm. as a in an effort to adhere to lowest impact possible um but to, to your point kind of in this area between the system and the road um Obviously, within the drainage easement, um, right. you know, we can't do that since that's DOT's sort of territory. But the area in between, um, you know, I, I think again, right now it's pretty much contemplated to be left as is. But we're happy to look into since we're already proposing, for example, any disturbed or you know, there obviously there will be construction on the site. There will be um, some machinery, some trucks coming in and out. There will be stabilization needed, probably replanting the grass. Mm -hmm. So we're happy to, um, where possible, along the front portion of the property, we're we're happy to to expand that seeding, for example, of a, of a, like a native uh, uh, pollinator flowering, uh, like kind of like a perennial, maybe like a meadow, if you call it mix. Right. Our, um, yeah, we're happy to take you know any anywhere where we can expand along the front of like seeding, uh, we we could we're happy to to do that as well. Um, and uh, uh, so yeah. I, I, Yes, we're we're happy to 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 expand if possible. I don't see it being something infeasible, and um, obviously we, we probably wouldn't go as far as saying to you know tear up the sod and replant or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, but yeah, we're we're happy to to maybe if it's a condition or where feasible or where possible, the applicant could 
um, expand the planting of, of uh, native pollinators, native flowering mixes, uh, you know, along the, the portion of the, the property uh, abutting the uh, Sutherland Road. So. Okay. So some there you have some language about that um, it, for repair of disturbed soil. Perhaps we can come up with a condition for the front of the building, or the front of the property fit between the street and the front of the building. Um, and it sounds like you'd be amenable to that. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Curious about three oh, you're breaking up. Craig, we can't hear check. you. We can't hear you. Your you must have the same air AirPods that I do. <laughs> Seems to happen to me. There we go. <laughs> A wired connection, always stronger than Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. No, not yet. Try those AirPods again. Try the AirPods again. Mr. Chair, can we use the chat? Yeah. Can we use the chat? Oh, yeah, we could use the chat. Yep. That is somebody with a lot of Zoom experience that came up with that suggestion. <laughs> Did you hear that, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> type into the chat, maybe. We, somebody should type to him. Oh, that's good spelling. Use the chart function. Yeah, it's the chat function. You got it. Chat. It just worked. It meant chat. <laughs> yeah, we can no also hear you, here. Craig, as well. <laughs> yeah, we hear you. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can do this. Craig, we were able to hear you just now. I don't know if you were aware. Um, your microphone was working again. <clears throat> Is it now? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can hear you. Yep. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, we should have yeah. told you. <laughs> I, I can talk faster than I can type. Okay. Um, one simple question. What are the sizes of the inverters? Yeah, good question. Let me, uh, off the top of my head, I believe they're Three uh, three thousand four hundred fifty uh, kilowatt inverters. Um, I believe our very initial application, we submitted a cut sheet of them, but they should be three. As uh, spec is uh, SMA Sunny Central three four five zero KW inverters. Okay, thank you. Um, and the second thing, I noticed that you have three options for extensions on your lease. What is the base contract? Uh, the base would be 20 years, one, one, one term of 20 years. And then, uh, the each ex optional extension would be, uh, five years each. It said six months each. Oh, sorry. Um, that would be our, sorry. Um, so our, our current agreement, which is an option to lease, that would be six months. Um, the actual agreement we would enter into 
uh, that we're, we're looking in there too, that the land owner would be a long-term lease. That would have an initial term of 20 years with three, five-year extensions after. So. And that does align with the utility contract you've got? Um, we Yes, we expect to do. Typically on all projects, whenever we interconnect with the utility, um, there, typically the interconnection service uh, really goes as long as we're, uh, we're the, the system is on and powered. So um, generally we never have issues with going beyond 20 years if, if we want to continue operating. And is your utility contract for um, the full 18 megawatts or is it somewhat less? Right now it's it's for the 18.7 megawatts. Um, there, the project is still, the study for the project is still active with Eversource. So there is still a possibility that Eversource could come back um, and requires to change the size of the, the system. Um, again, not above, we would never go more than what we have now. It, there's a possibility to go less, but for now it is the 18.7. You don't have any fudge factor in there? Um, when you say fudge factor in terms of uh, general oversizing the system or? Well, as, as you get degradation, you're not gonna be able to provide the, uh, the entire amount. Right, correct. So the, the initial number of installed battery units is slightly over, so the 18.87 megawatts AC, four hour battery. Um, again, tra translating that, uh, I don't have the, my math is not good enough for right now for that, but around 75 megawatt hours. Um, that, that number, we're slightly oversized from the beginning. So we're roughly 10 to 15% oversized uh, to provide, you know, uh, above and beyond that initial uh, capacity limit. Uh, then as it degrades, so we start oversized, we degrade down. Once we get to a point where we would drop below uh, what that max capacity we're allowed to, to discharge at and what we would have a contractual obligation with ICU New England to provide, then we would augment. And so that's where those additional unit, uh, the enhanced hatched uh, markings along the Southern portion of the site, those, are, those would remain empty initial installation and we would add those additional units later to stay at, at our uh, initial capacity. And I assume that you're controlling remotely. Are you controlling or is uh, ISO New, New England controlling? So we're controlling, so we'll have a 24 seven remote operations center controlling the system and controlling all dispatch charging and discharging. Um, typically, we can basically charge and discharge uh, when we want for, for you know whatever price signals are in the market that ISO New England's running. If there's any capacity call, so if ISO New England is, you know, issues a capacity call, we may be required to charge discharge during those specific high demand times. Uh, but we would we would be the one to in the system. Okay, and your cybersecurity is coming out of in what level? Um, I would have to follow up uh, with uh, the manufacturer on the exact level. Um, typically, we're going to ensure, you know, obviously a very high level uh, of localized security for the system data itself. Uh, and then in terms of data traffic going out of the site, um, a secure connection, encrypted connection going directly to our remote operations center so that, you know, no one can, can scoop on that. Um, but if there's a specific uh, reference or rating you're looking for there, I'm happy to, to provide that. No, I, I just want to make sure that it is, it is secure mm -hmm. and um, your controller is not obvious. Oh, yes, absolutely. So physically speaking, there's a, there's a level of physical security for the controllers. So those are all in locked cabinets. So if someone wanted to get a physical connection to the system, that would be you know extremely difficult. Uh, and we would we would know if someone were tampering with the system remotely. Uh, and then yeah, all any traffic in the outside would be encrypted uh, as well. So. Okay, that's all I had. You know, I I had one question that's really very basic. And I don't I never have I don't know how much power you've got in that battery in those batteries what 18.75 megawatts really means in terms of how many homes it could light up uh, how long it could you know how how much power is going to be in those batteries and how much 
benefit would the community get from having those batteries come online? Not, not from a sense of power, not from the um, uh, cost savings, but from the sense of what you can light up, what you can power with that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, generally speaking, um, so obviously everything's measured in kilowatt hours, megawatt hours. Um, so our system is 18.87 megawatts for our battery. So again, let's just call it around 75 megawatt hours. Uh, that's So that's what could be charged in a day and discharged in a day or in a four hour period of charge and discharge. Um, your average home, so you know, a lot of appliances you have are in kilowatt hour, kilowatt rating. So washing machine, um, HVAC units are in wattages. Typically an average annual home's energy usage, depending obviously on how big it is and where you're at in the country, but let's just call it somewhere between nine and 11,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, that would be like a typical home's annual energy usage. So, from that perspective, every day a battery system would be charging to charge enough energy that could power a single home's annual usage, or I should say around six to seven annual homes usage. So there's a, quite a bit of energy that's being charged and discharged every day and, and certainly every year uh, with the system. So um, in terms of where, what these systems are intended to be utilized for, uh, which is really shifting that clean energy mm -hmm. from generated to when it's when demand is most, um, it's actually making quite a bit of impact in terms of you know the amount of homes and that are using electricity and how much energy is in carbon emissions or subsequently offset. Great, thank you. Other questions from the board, Mr. Laracy? Is there anything else you wish to uh, advise us on or comment on before we go to public comment? I don't think so. I, again, I appreciate all the questions and clarifications. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to, to moving, moving the project forward. Um, now's the opportunity for the public to comment. Um, staff will help identify if there are, if there is anybody who wishes to ask a question of the, uh, the applicant. Again, the questions must be directed to the chair and staff will recognize you if you're on the computer, raise your hand. If you're on the phone, press nine. I see no raised hands. Nope. So um, one last opportunity for us to ask questions if we have any further questions for um, the applicant. All right, if not, I would, um, we now will move to the, um, public meeting and I would move, we'll move to the public meeting without closing the public hearing in case we need to gather additional information. And the public meeting is typically where the board deliberates on the, the matter before us. It is not normally a time for public comment, but we reserve the right to get comment, of, especially from the applicant for clarification. Um, I'm looking I'll tell you where I'm kind of coming from in this, this specific application is I'm inclined to believe that the applicant and Blue Wave has uh, responded positively to most of the suggestions and questions we had. It seems to me that there's a real need for this kind of um, enterprise across the country and be beneficial to the community um, as well. And um, I'm inclined to move ahead with perhaps a couple of additional conditions, but to move ahead with this application. I'd like to get the feeling of the board and we can talk about specific conditions or concerns you might have. But do I have any, does anybody have additional comments they want to make at this time? Okay. So um, if there are no further questions and no further comments, what I'd like to do is go to conditions first, review conditions that we have, um, and then adopt them in block by going through them. If anybody, as we always do, if anybody objects to a specific condition, we'll set it aside. So I'd like to deal with the ones that were in the, in the project application report first, and then move to the, uh, any additional new conditions second. So if we look at the project application report, page 
25, at the end of page 25, the possible conditions start. The first one is um, sort of boilerplate, it's, it's, but the topic has been mentioned that it has to be, this really requires this project to be built as per the plans that have been submitted and approved. Um, and so those, to that extent, to the wall, talking about the wall and about the, uh, the placement of the plants, et cetera, et cetera, all that has to be done with the possible exception of minor changes, which can be approved by the business commi commissioner. The second one is um, that, that no longer the conditions in, in the former um, special pro, uh, special permit have expired. Um, third is that the, the a new owner must be uh, have a management plan submitted and reviewed by the zoning board of appeals at a public meeting. Um, all previous approvals and conditions authorized by the conservation commission shall be adhered to at all times. Um, and I, we don't have to. Those conditions are contained in that document. We don't have to list all those conditions. Number five, the emergency management plan shall be reviewed by the Amherst Fire and Police Departments and shall be submitted to the building commissioner for approval prior to the issue of the building permit. Um, and I think we would want to add that um, it has similarly, it has to be uh, submitted to the fire and police and approved by the building commissioner. Uh, prior to the certificate to the COC certificate of occupancy, or what would be the, the terminology we want to use there, Rob? So that I mean, this is a building permit, which is one thing, but you're going to have stuff actually on site, and you have to have a second approval, I think. Or do you not? Uh, I would I would just say final approval. That'll cover final approval of instead of build right instead of building permit. permit. Okay, all right. Sorry, final so approval by whom? Building commissioner. It says okay. submitted to the building commissioner for approval prior to issues of final. Uh, well, we'll, re we'll rework that. Uh, shall be submitted to the building commissioner for final approval. For final approval. Right. But it was before the COC is what we were talking about earlier. So, so C COC is not a, a real thing that gets issued by oh. the building department. So <laughs> no. that's why I'm saying I'm, I'm suggesting that that it's say shall be submitted to the building commissioner prior to final approval. And that will cover all the various inspections and uh, sign offs by all of the officials. So submitted, submitted to you before final approval and it wouldn't be, you don't give final approval without approving it. <laughs> so final oh, approval correct. is your discretion. So we don't have to empower you to approve it. Got it. Okay. The Amherst and Sunderland Fire Department shall be properly notified and trained on the property on the appropriate emergency response techniques. Alarms shall be installed on underground water storage tanks to indicate whether failed sump, sub, sump pumps, I think that's supposed to be, or is, are they sub pumps, Rob? I think it's sump pumps. Yeah, okay. That's or a, tank overflow. That's a typo on my bad. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the sound barrier wall must be painted green. Let's, I would like to, to alter that to say something to the effect that the, the, um, the sound barrier wall shall be painted a color um, intended to blend into the environment or you had indicated you may want to look to a mural or is, um, is, is there a, like a public art commission, Rob, or somebody that in town that would review this? So. I don't want to make it too difficult for you to, to hire a local artist to do a mural or to paint, but there are some pretty cool things done in the valley here. And I'd like to give you that opportunity. So how about if we allow that a color that blends into the environment, um, which then, uh, which I think green is one, but there'd be several, or to work with the, um, to, to work to with the approval of the, Fine art, the Public Arts Commission, a um, design on the design approved by the, the Public Arts Commission, something to that effect. What do you think? The board, Rob, Mora. So, so there wouldn't actually be a requirement to submit to the art Public Art Commission for for a private installation like this. So, 
um, you know, we, we might be able to work on some wording about, you know, recommendation by seek recommendation uh, prior to, um, you know, I, I think of when we, if you remember, I think you were here, Mr. Judge, when we uh, issued uh, the, the permits for a rise out in North Amherst. Yep. And, you know, that went through a, a process of a public process and, and, you know, kind of a, their own um, request for proposals by artists process uh, more more critical than than our process was so um you know i think i think maybe recommendations by a committee that's experienced but uh ultimately this board would control when and how that happens so i think the condition has to start here um you know whether you're requiring it or leaving it as an opportunity uh to occur if the applicant chooses to take it um, clarifying that and then my only other suggestion is that uh, there'd be some language that would allow or have the board review the landscape plan if that, you know, mural option was taken yeah. because the plants would block everything that was all the work that was just done uh, if if yeah. the landscape plan was maintained. All right. What does the board think about that? Have we made it too a good thing too complicated? Um, Sarah, I mean, Ms. Marshall? Um, yeah, I, I wonder, though, if we have to address, there seem to be two proposals, one to make or, or hopes, wishes, that the mm -hmm. entire wall all the way around be a color that blends in with the environment versus a mural or some art that might only be on the roadside. So I just throw that, throw that out there. Mm -hmm. I guess... Ms. Ms. Parks, you you actually were there at the site visit when this came up yeah. as well. I don't think we should have anything in the conditions about the mural. It's just a nice idea. And, you know, it's, it's something that they could, you know, that it would be nice if, 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 if they would look at that and as that as a possibility. But I really don't think it should be a condition. I don't think it should be, I, I don't think that anything should matter about that for um, this project. So... I will, I'll just say, I'd like you to think about a mural, but it not as a condition. But you, would, you wouldn't you would think that they would have, would you have, want them to come back to the ZBA if they wanted to do a mural or just do it on their own? If they want to do a mural, they do a mural. Is that uh, what you're thinking? Uh, I don't know. I, I think we should yeah. let that idea go for now. I, I think there's <laughs> enough conditions on the project and it's a really big project, and so I, it's, I, I prefer not to add add things that aren't necessary right now. So, got it, Mr. Maxfield. Well, I uh, think it may be a way to kind of simplify this while while satisfying everybody here with this. Is we could say that it's going to be um, a natural color for the fence, or the applicant may choose to. Uh, work with a local artist to um, paint a mural. We could say something like that. So it is that, or they can do that if it ends up making sense. Do, do people like that idea? Would we'll leave it up to the to Blue Wave to decide. Do we need to approve that? I mean, you're not a, you're not suggesting that it comes back to the ZBA for approval. For the design, we just we could also open. just put in if they so choose yeah. um, that we could yeah. just just whatever whatever we want to terms we want to put on the, the the mural. Just say it has to be some green brown natural color, or if you want to do a mural, and then whatever conditions we want to do on a mural, and then we can kind of kind of let it go from there. That way, we're not bogging them down. But if it ends up being a yeah. great idea and everybody loves it, there we go. We get the mural. I'm, that works for me. And I, I, I don't really want to be in the business of approving a mural um, in terms of public. And, no, and none of you should want me to be in that position either with my taste. So, um, Rob, can you kind of come up with, can you come up with some language that works with that? I mean, it's pretty close to what we're talking about. Yeah. So basically, um, and I'm assuming you're talking to me, Rob, right? Not Rob Mora. Uh, just, he was about to. 
he was about to turn on his uh, microphone just now. Um, so I could just word it and say um, that you have to make the wall color blend in with the environment. That's that's a condition that the board wants to see, but mm -hmm. the mural portion can be optional if the applicant so chooses to. That's kind of how I'm going to approach some, it. Is, okay. Or the applicant can choose to have a, a yeah. mural. Yep. And and if the and I think Rob's part about the landscaping makes sense, but mm -hmm. you can work a mural around those trees if you're, if you're going to have a mural. So. All right. But it looks to me like we have three or four people that agree with that. So uh, assuming that that is the will of the board, we'll move on unless anybody wants to segregate that out. Um, an updated construction schedule with accurate dates shall be submitted to the building commissioner prior to the issuance of building permit. Construction logistics must be submitted prior to the issuance of a building, building permit. Load calculations must be provided for the underground water tank withstand the weight of necessary vehicles or equipment prior to issuance of a building permit. All structures associated with the battery or energy storage system shall be removed within one year of said prior, prior to the issuance of a building permit for the best. The applicant shall post and submit a bond or other financial security acceptable to the building commissioner. The submission must be accompanied by a decommissioning plan with an accurate decommissioning cost generated by a registered engineer with a 20 year escalation to account for inflation and public uh, and a public projects factor. Um, special permit is granted to BWC Eastman Brook LLC of PO uh, box 171381 Boston, Massachusetts. If the owner of the battery storage system were to change, the new owner must come before the zoning board to review the conditions of the special permit. Those are the ones contained in the draft. There's some other ones that were raised as possibility. Yes, Ms. Marshall. I have a question about uh, condition one, D. Yep. Degradation yep. plan. If that's the thing Mr. Meadows had requested, I don't think we're getting that. So should that be, or, or is this something else? I think that is a, well, um, Mr. Meadows, you were the one that were asking about it. Is what they said, does that satisfy your um, interest? Yes, that satisfied my interest. Uh, additionally, uh, you just mentioned a 20 year demolition plan. Uh, yeah. If you recall, I asked him about the timeline, and he's got a 20 year lease with three five year extensions possible. So I think we need to word that a little bit differently. I'll just, I'll just offer a clarification. I just, yeah, 20 year initial lease with uh, extensions, but all the best practices. So you're breaking up, but I thought it, you, did you accept the notion of a 20 year with five, with three five year extensions, a, a surety bond based on that number? Okay, I don't know what that does to the price of the bond. That does for me. After, yeah, that's that's uh, good. With, good on Blue then. So. Okay, well, so we'll, uh, Mr. we can. Yep, Mr. Wachilla. Yeah, so I just want to give some background on these bonds. So usually they're renewed annually. Um, so every bond company that I've dealt with working in where uh, they usually send an automatic renewal every year to the town. That's just standard practice. Um, the 20 year escalation factor is more for the cost of decommissioning the facility. Um, so say if the applicant were to choose a different form of surety, so they, if, if they didn't want to do the bond, they would rather do like a cash deposit instead. I don't really see a lot of people who do that nowadays, but if they wanted to, they would give us an amount to cover the costs 20 years from now of removing um, those units and restoring the site. So that's what the escalation factor is put in there for. Um, I caution against making it overly complicated with the language for that, because at any point, the building commissioner could request that they give us new numbers after a certain amount of time. Uh, so that's that's basically what that condition's entailing. And I just want to make the board a, aware of that. Uh, Ms. Marshall, was your point to the deck, to the uh, surety bond or or not? No, back to my original question. Okay. About the All right. We'll, we'll, let's get back to that in a second. We'll get back to that okay. in a second on degradation. <laughs> I, I don't want to lose a train of thought here. Mr. Meadows. Uh, I, 
I think 20 years sounds good, but if they've got, if they opt for the three five year extensions, then we're talking about 35 years. So we have to have some mechanism to account for the additional cost if it goes to 35 years as opposed to 20 years. I see. Okay. So yeah, yeah that's. Does the board want to consider then adding some extra language that says if those options are executed, then account for them as well in the estimate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll definitely add that. Or at the time, at the time there, those options are exercised. That, okay. that might be the way to do it is to, as opposed to imposing the cost of a 35 year bond um, with some, 20 years plus, and then when they exercise the option, there's an additional, they have to come back with an additional bond, additional uh, larger bond. That's what I mean to say. Okay. Okay. All right. Do we need to have that restated? I think, I think you got the gist of that. I don't think we need to have that restated here. Okay. Ms. Marshall, you want to go back to degradation. Yeah, just that we don't have we don't have a degradation plan, so I don't think it should be in this list. Oh. Right. Well, that's a good point. That's that's true, but um, there was a isn't isn't there some kind of representation? Didn't you say that? Ms. Well, this is listing plans what, that we have received. Do we have? Not, I mean, right. it's implied that it's in writing, and it's not. So we should just eliminate it, unless unless. We want the applicant to put in writing what was represented to us earlier in the meeting and call it a degradation. Yeah, I, but, I, but that's what I okay. thought you. That's what I thought he was going to do is put something in writing of which would memorialize how he represented just, it to the we board. Just confirm that then. Thank you. Yep. Is that right, Mr. Larissa? You're willing to do that, right? Yeah, I, certainly. I did provide a right what I said earlier regarding general degradation and then uh, an anticipated augmentation. Great. I think that's that should satisfy your concerns. It doesn't, Mrs. Marshall. Great. Thank you. Um, anybody else? All right. Let's move to other conditions. Uh, the board should discussing whether it's still a condition on sound measurement post to ensure compliance with the noise assessment carried out by EPSO. Um, you know, I, I would, I normally would want to do a second, you know, or once you're, once you're up and running to check it. And I think that's probably makes some sense, but it, I guess we should just do it once, but the, the level of noise coming from this is really pretty low. I mean, we're talking level of kind of conversation is what is what I saw in the plan. Uh, the highest level was probably was 45 or 50 decibels, which is at the street level. And, and it's, it seems pretty low. Um, I know that there's some concern that some energy battery systems buzz, but this one, I don't know if that if this is the case here. What's the board's feeling on this? My feeling is that it's pr probably one check um, after you switch this the switch on, um, have, a, have Epsilon come back and, and make a noise assessment, but I wouldn't do much more than that because I think they're pretty, I think it's pretty low. Okay. Um, okay, we talked about the sound barrier wall. Is there a desire to, to require bollards or um, not? Or is there, or is the, um, is it the feeling of the board that they, that the security is to be adequate and that if there is a light, if the, if the if the sound barrier is not sufficient to protect the perceived threats, except for the farm equipment, that would take it upon that the owner of the property would put those bollards up on their own uh, on their own volition, and would just have to go to the um, building commissioner to get an amendment plan to do that. Ms. Parks, I don't think it should be a condition, but I, I mean it's on them if if something yeah. happens facility and it, it's not really going to damage the environment because they have the drainage system and so I think I mean if I were them that this is a consideration for them mm -hmm. more than it is for us I think 
So I wouldn't make it a condition, but you know, they should think about those things. And I hope they're, I don't know what the, what the, I know the wall has I-beams, but I don't know what the material is in between. So, yeah. you know, that's something that they should look into. Yeah. That's my feeling about yeah. it. I, I'm inclined to agree with that. I don't think it creates a lot of public health risk. Um, and the chances of it are pretty low of the, of, uh, a vehicle crashing into it. So I, I agree with you that it's probably on, on them to protect their investment more than it is to protect the public health. Mr. Chair? Yep. Can I speak to that? Ms. Marshall. Yes, yes. you sure can. <laughs> um, my interest in bollards or rocks or whatever, some kind of barrier, um, is because of two concerns, and if those concerns are allayed, then then I withdraw the the whole suggestion. One that it's um, not a danger to the public if something crashes through the wall and strikes one of those units. Um, you know, obviously the driver of the vehicle, obviously that's that's a problem, but it's not a danger to the public. If that's true, then okay. And second of all, it's not it's not gonna throw our power grid into into chaos if some part parts of it, or if the whole thing has to be taken offline to deal with whatever the damage has been caused. Those those are the reasons I'm I'm interested. Otherwise, it's a matter of you protecting <laughs> your very valuable equipment. It was my impression that the first question was answered by Mr. Laracy early on. I mean, er, er, earlier by saying that it, it's very, it's, you, you might have a, a, a fire for a while. It's very small likelihood of that. And then it's a small fire. So it's not a lot of, I, I came away from that th thinking there wasn't a lot of danger, risk of danger and threat to the public safety. I can't believe this is going to, if it would go down, I can't believe that it's large enough to endanger um, or even to seriously affect the, the our grid out here. But I, that is something I don't know. So I guess I just look to Mr. Laracy to, to affirm that or, or not. Sure, so happy to speak to that. Um, so, there's a few layers of protection for the grid uh, in regard to any malfunction or, or abnormality uh, in operation with the equipment. Uh, so the power conversion system itself, so the inverters there that uh, basically take take the energy from the batteries and send it up uh, into the red wires, uh, those have protection settings. Uh, so if there's any you know, abnormal uh, conditions detected in the batteries or if some issue happened in the batteries, those inverters have, have some fail safes in them. Uh, Blue Wave, as part of our air connection process with Eversource, we have a series of three poles that have protection equipment, and Eversource will also install their own redundant set of poles that have protection equipment. So those each have a load break disconnect that can fully separate the system from the grid. Um, and base, so basically, like if there's, we, we can shut down the system and shut it off from the grid, uh, and also Eversource can and will do the same if there's any, any conditions detected they could could cause some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, damage or issue with the grid. So, uh, no, we I wouldn't expect the system would shut down. Um, it wouldn't. It would no longer send power out of the grid, um, and it wouldn't cause the the grid in Amherst to to have any issues. All right. Does that satisfy your your concerns, Ms. Marshall? All right. Good. Um, I had a couple of other. Um, a couple of other conditions. One is deals with the. Um, I have a condition that the lights are dark sky compliant. I don't. I don't see that in the management plan, or I didn't. I don't ha didn't notice it any place. So a condition that lights are dark sky compliant is in accordance with our rules and regulations. Um, I think it seems to me that we should. We need to either make a decision about whether you put up a, a monument sign or whether you just put signs up on the wall and whether whether there's four signs on on the property on every single wall. So I think a condition that said there's four either amend your signage plan or a condition that there's four signs on the on the sound wall. 
And then we have to decide whether there's a to be a monument um, sign or not. And I said they were uh, amenable to having a monument sign. I think it's a good idea to just have it out there as opposed to just uh, identification on the, the wall, which could get overgrown with trees and shrubs over time. Um, lastly, cut sheets, sound wall, high voltage signs. And lastly is the, is sort of the ground, taking care of the ground and the landscaping in the front. And I think that can be, um, I think you could amend your management plan um, where you talk about how you're going to repair the, the ground and you give special attention to repairing the, uh, and, and providing reseeding with native plants, bushes and uh, shrubs um, in the area on the front of the building. And I think if you amend your, your management plan to do that, I think you don't need to put a condition in, but I think if you do that, then you have to abide by the management plan and, and you, it gives you more flexibility and you, and you can uh, but you can still um, do it at the same time or be required to do it. All yeah, right. Okay. Yes, Ms. Marshall. I don't have a strong feeling about a monument sign, but if if that is a condition, does the applicant need to return to us with a plan? I mean, we have reviewed I, such, you know, so, monument sign plans in the past, or do we just say, let the building commissioners? <laughs> well, I would I would leave it up to the building commissioner. I know they've got enough work to do, but um, I I think we're going to have too much work to do coming up to review a monument sign. I think. I don't so think we need we're to. We're not do obliged that. Yeah. to. We're not obliged. We don't have to review it if we. Were I don't think what Rob has got his hand up, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to opine at all on anything okay. until I hear from Mr. Mora. No, that's fine. I was just going to mention now, uh, so it doesn't get lost. When you get further along, you will need to grant a waiver under uh, Section 8.5 for the uh, the maximum number of signs that are permitted in the residential district uh, pertaining to the use. Uh, which is two. Uh, so I just oh. want just to make you aware of that. Uh, it wasn't an issue when there was just one sign being proposed, but yeah. with four or five signs, uh, if you could just grant, the, you know, acknowledge that waiver being granted and, you know, I'm happy to deal with the rest of it when, when it comes up for construction. All right. After we vote on the conditions, we'll move right to the waiver of 8.2. Yeah, 8.5. It's actually it's section 8.101 is the section that has the limit of the, the number of signs, and then 8.5 is the section that authorizes the waiver, any of the provision. All right. Could you repeat Great. the sections, please? You said 8.5, and what was the other one? 8.101. Okay, thank you. Ms. Parks. Um, does that signage include like danger high voltage or is it just the name of the of the business? I thought it was just the name of the business and that danger high voltage was on the wall was on the sound walls. Okay, because I, I agree with um, Sarah's suggestion that there's, you know, danger high voltage on all of the surface areas, or at least on the front and the back. But when you say monument sign, I just want to make sure I understand that, because I guess when I think of monument sign, I think of something made of stone. But this is like just something on two posts, right? Right. All right. And I, I would... it's freestanding is what I, I think of it as something freestanding. Okay. And yeah. That's what I thought you meant. I would say that for yeah. me, I, I'll just throw out that I think it will make it look more like a friendly business than a penitentiary. Again, with a yeah. freestanding sign, it will be a little friendlier. Blue Wave is a nice name. So, you know, I I would I would recommend that as well. Great. Any other comments from board members? And then we'll go to Mr. Wachilla. Okay, Mr. Wachilla. Could I recommend to the board, uh, you just, you did suggest proposing a condition for the signs. Um, can we change the word monument sign to freestanding sign so it's more broad, um, just so the applicant right. doesn't have to get a sign with masonry work involved? Right. Yeah, whatever, whatever is the correct term of art there is, is perfect. Is what we want. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, we do not want, I don't want them putting up a gravestone. All right. 
Okay, so um, I've not heard any objection to any of the outlined conditions. So I would entertain a motion that we approve the conditions as laid out in the um, proposed the application report with the modifications that we have discussed and the additional conditions that we have discussed. So is there a, all right, and I heard us, I think I heard two, so there's a second. Ms. Marshall, yes. it's moved by Ms. Parks. Craig. Um, oh, Mr. Meadows seconded. Uh, any discussion on the motion? If not, this is a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. All right. The conditions are approved. Next, we'll go to our findings and waivers. Um, thank you for catching that, Mr. Mora. Um, the first thing I'd want to do is, is note that we that we should um, waive eight point uh, the limits in eight point one zero one, and that authority to do that waiver is found in section eight point five. So that would be an amendment to the, the plan, and that we approve the waiver. Um, since we're doing that, was just added here, and it wasn't currently in the plan or in the uh, project application. I would think it'd be a good idea to vote on that. Um, so this deals with the this deals with the signs. I have a motion to approve the waiver. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the waiver. 8.101 and 8.5. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Great. Now we'll make our findings. Uh, there's several findings. Um, the first is um, that it's in the conservation district that roadways laid out in the manner to have the least possible impact on adjacent land or agricultural lands um, with all the drainage work they did. I think they satisfied that. 3.2857, every reason why effort should be made to maintain views of open agricultural lands from nearby public ways. I would just remove that first bullet. There is no existing agricultural activity on 515 or in the abutting properties. There looks to be, you know, agricultural um, activity on abutting properties, but I think that a reason, every reasonable effort has been made to maintain the views of open agricultural lands. Um, so I think you take away that first bullet. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. So therefore, Where are you? Yep. So I'm under section, I'm under, um, what's well, on page 19 of the project draft project application report. We're looking at, uh, the findings we have to make. For me, they start on page 22, the 10.38 specific findings. Yeah, I'm back earlier. That's 10.38 we'll go through as well. Oh, these are oh. the other, these are other sections. I'm some sorry. of them are not applicable and some we just have to find that we're not violating the, the intent zoning bylaw. So the second one is 3.2857. I don't think it applies in this case. Um, I mean, I, I do think it applies, but I think they've done, they've made a reasonable effort to not obscure open the view of open agricultural land. Section 3.3 .3, use and classification standards. This is, this is allowed in um, the, the districts that it sits in. Section six is dimensional requirements. The first one is fences. The applicant is installing a 16 foot uh, fence, a sound barrier, a sound barrier will be, the, will be within all the setbacks. The second part, it deals with landscaping will be required subject to conditions. And um, the last is that the height of the barrier is, um, is within limits. The limit is 35 feet. Uh, this is high is the highest um, fence in permitted this is a 16 foot sound barrier um, so it's less than the, the maximum limit so it meets those 
dimensional regulations. Parking requirements, uh, so there's sufficient parking for the use of the, of the, um, of the property. Uh, but more importantly, it's talking about the dense graded crushed stone and the proposed driveway will slope of the driveway, all which meet the um, requirements. 7.13103, again, setbacks, um, satisfies that. No building structures are in the proposed access driveways. And there's a minimum width entrance and exit of 18 feet. And this is a, a 20 foot driveway. Um, Oh, excuse me, a minimum of 10 feet, and we have an 18 foot wide for two way use. The minimum road was, yeah, but we have um, satisfied that. We've got no portion of the driveway. The edge of the street pavement shall be closer than 75 feet from the intersection. So the proposed driveway exceeds the, exceeds the requirement, which is good. And uh, um, I guess we didn't talk about whether the emergency vehicles can safely turn around. I guess that's why the hammerhead is been put there so we would hear from the fire department if that didn't work yep okay 7.7 .7 access requirements and driveways this is where we talk about the 20 foot driveway 20 foot wide driveway the requirement is it exceeds the requirement of 12 feet and it, and it also um, does not exceed the slope requirements so i think we're they've met the, the conditions the requirements of that section section 7.9 deals with parking regulations we don't uh, we should i think we have to waive we don't have to waive them they just do we have to waive the parking requirements rob mora or we just there aren't any for this are there 7.90 no i believe you just went through confirming compliance yeah. with all the designs everything for so everything there's, there's nothing to waive yep okay okay now we're at 10.38 so um, 10.380 and 10.381, this is basically that it's lo located in a suitable location. Um, I believe that it is in a suitable location. It's, in, it's, a, it's, by, uh, it's allowed by special permit in the two zoning districts in which the property six. Um, and I think it fits within the surrounding areas. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387. This Generally, these sections generally deal with nuisance and um, disturbance from the prop from the use of the property on the neighboring sites. Uh, and I think the there's they've demonstrated that there's very little um, nuisance from flood, noise, odor, dust, vibrations, and they've imposed a, and they've constructed a 16 foot high wall to minim to minimize the um, nuisance to the neighbors. So I think they've met the requirements of those four sections. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities and provided for proper operation and proposed use. Um, they have the needed equipment to, to safely handle the site, respond to emergency situations and handle on-site repairs and management. It's in their O&M plan. 10.386, uh, we've already dealt with this parking and we, Sign, well, there will be signs erected. So we have to change this, Rob. Uh, we have to change this. All right. So we'll change this to accommodate the four signs and the land and the uh, freestanding sign. 10.387 the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular traffic and within the within the um, within the site. Um, it, I think they have um, done that. And I just, but I, and I don't think there's going to be any, I'm going to share, you're not going to have vehicles inside once this is constructed. You're, you're not, vehicles are not going to be going inside the, the, the sound barrier. Yeah. You're going to do everything by a crane. Just within the portion of the access road that's on the northern boundary. Yeah. Okay. So I think you've met the requirements of 10.387. 10.388 proposal ensures adequate space for off street loading and parking. Uh, yeah, the hammerhead drive seems to do that. And there's also, there's, you're not going to be, you're not be delivering materials there very often. 10.389, uh, the proposal provides adequate methods of disposal and or of recyclables. After construction, I don't think there's going to be very much in the way of um, 
trash there, but should there be, um, there, your management plan has you taking it away from the site. Uh, 10.390, the proposal ensures fire protection and flood hazards. Um, we've talked about this um, and you're gonna be getting your, your number one, you have, a, you seem to have um, complied with all the UL and other kinds of industry standards for safety. You're having an excellent, um, you'll have a um, approval from the fire department and the police departments and the building commissioners for the um, material there. And, and it's not located in a floodplain. I guess this is all floodplain. I'm sorry, I thought this was more than that. So you're not in a floodplain. You don't have to deal with 3.90. 3.91. Not applicable. 3.92, adequate landscaping. Um, I think you meet all this. It's up around the, the sound barrier wall. We talked about the uh, reseeding of, of natural plants and, and um, pollinators. And you have specified which trees uh, in your site in your additional detail. 10.393. Protection of adjacent properties by vending intrusion of lighting. You're going to have. You're going to comply with the review uh, with the rules of the, the ZBA regarding um, downcast lighting. Uh, Ten point three nine four. Flat piece of property. No floodplains. I don't think this is. Aside from the um, order of conditions from the ComCom, I don't think you're going to be. Um, endangering the wetlands or you're not on steep slopes. 10.395 does not create disharmony with respect to terrain use, scale, and architecture. Um, yeah, so you, you've limited the sound. Uh, you've gone to great lengths to, or you, you've agreed to go to, to um, paint so that it doesn't alter, it doesn't create disharmony. Paint something to, so it matches the natural colors. Um, that it won't create disharmony in the district. Um, and you're also, you're dealing with the sound um, at a low level through the construction of the sound barrier. And you're going to have an applicant, uh, you're going to have the um, sound company come out once after construction is completed to check that. 10.396, proposals provide screening for storage areas. Um, I think this is fine. It, the sound barrier will protect everything. 10.397, adequate recreational. This is not applicable. 10.398 is in harmony general purpose and intent of the bylaw. The proposal abides by the aus auspices of the zoning bylaw, despite the fact that that's regulation still is in progress. It also abides by Massachusetts renewable energy goals and ambitions. So it's, I, I don't think it's by, proposed by the auspices, but the, um, the aspirations. <laughs> Of, of the, you know, of the um, bylaw or something to that effect, Rob. But um, I think the, I find, and I think the board agrees that we've met the uh, requirements under 10.38 and the other sections of the zoning bylaw. And we can find that we've complied with them. With that, um, is there any other discussion from board members before we have a motion to approve the project application with conditions? Oh, well, let's vote on the on the findings before we do that. Um, is there a motion to to make the findings as just discussed by me in block for um, section ten point three eight and the rest of the sections? So moved. So moved. <laughs> I hear a, I hear a move. <laughs> I, I hear one, and then I hear two. We've got uh, a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? All in favor, um, it's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. All right. We've made the find required findings under the zoning bylaw. The next motion is to is a motion to approve the application um, before us with conditions. Oops, Ms. Marshall? Just when do we close the public hearing? I'm sorry, this, I just we'll, don't know. We'll After. do that as part, 
We'll, no, we'll do this as part of, the, of this motion. But we see. close the public. Okay. We'll, we'll, we will um, vote. We'll approve the special application. The motion will be to approve the special application report with uh, the special permit with conditions and that we close a public hearing and public meeting on, on this application. That's the motion. Is there a, such a motion? Sure. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> we got one. I'll move so, that. <laughs> all right. And I think I heard Mr. Meadows for two. Yeah. Uh, all right. Is there any discussion? So the vote occurs on the motion to approve the special permit application with conditions and to close the public hearing and public meeting on this application. Roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Great. Vote is five to zero. Unanimous vote. Um, congratulations. You've got your special permit. Um, you, you've got some work yet to do to keep the, to make the changes to your management plans and other things which we discussed. Uh, the staff has got a note of those things. Um, and you've also got um, some work to do with the, um, the emergency response plan coming up. But congratulations. And if you have, um, you, you, you'll work with, with Rob and company. And we wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for members of the Council of Questions. Uh, it was great working with you. Um, I'll call with Rob, uh, the planning department on on Amy and follow up Adams, and then um, certainly I'll look to keep keep the board in touch and in communication as we're, we're moving forward. But I uh, really do appreciate your uh, your questions and uh, board and moving forward. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next order of business is. Um, General public comment on matters not before the board tonight. We have four attendees and three attendees. And I don't see any hands up. All right. No public comment on matters not before the board tonight. Other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. And what I would add is the, I don't think there's, there's any, Business from board members. And new business is just, I would add that we need to schedule out the next meetings. Uh, what do we have coming up, Rob? Oops, I can't hear you. There, sorry, I forgot I was on mute. Um, so the next meeting we have, I believe is June 8th. We have two permits that are upcoming for special permit. Uh, one is a, extension and the other is a modification to the existing permit. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into details about those permits, but uh, essentially uh, one, actually, I don't really have that on top of my head right now, Mr. Nope. Chairman, but it's all right. Get the we need, idea. Yep. Uh, we, June, so we've got two things on the, on June 8th. Yep. Okay. The June 22nd. Yep. Sorry. June 22nd is um, so far there's one hearing scheduled and that's for a um, modification as well. So they're pretty, pretty short hearings from what the foreseeable future seems like. Um, so that's what we have scheduled right now. Um, we don't have anything for July or August put in place yet. So the June 22nd, mm -hmm. oh, I will be in town. Okay, all right, yep. Okay, good enough. All right, Ms. Parks. I just wanted to let everyone know that my commission ends on June 30th, so my last meeting will be uh, June 22nd, I think, uh, Dylan as well. So it's really been wonderful serving with everybody. It's really, I've really enjoyed being on the ZBA. I think it's a great committee and I'm going to miss it, but I have a yeah. lot of other stuff happening in my life now. Well, we've really enjoyed working with you and we'll say formal goodbyes when on your last or your formal thank yous on your last meeting. But and it's been a real pleasure to work with you, Tammy. Thanks. And just one aside. Sorry, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't supposed to desert me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess Craig to join other committees. It's not fair. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Not really bad. <laughs> All right. Mr. Maxfield, did you have your hand up too? Nope. 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 But well, I, uh, I didn't I, know Tammy was going. Sad to see you, you leave too. It's the uh, end of an era here. I know. Yeah. I, I, I think we've both been on it. Well, were you you were on it before the last three term, the last three years, right? Nope. I, uh, this will be the end of my my three year to, term. I think you were on slightly before me. You were on as an associate member yeah. first, or? Yeah, I I think for two yeah. years. I don't know. Yeah. For two years, I think. Yeah. I think so you were two yeah. years altogether. Well, you know, for both of you guys, Rob didn't test. Didn't, he couldn't come right to, off the top of his head that what was in the, on uh, the agenda for June 22nd, but there's a really long 40B application that comes up 22nd. So we're going to hook you in and then you'll be, you'll be <laughs> with us for three or four months. <laughs> a couple more months left, you know. So you, you, we're not saying goodbye yet. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's another, what's no. another year? <laughs> yeah, what's another year? That day. <laughs> All right. Well, anything else? Well, again, thank you to the staff on this one. We appreciate it. And we appreciate your time tonight. And I appreciate all of your efforts uh, from all the members doing their work. And we'll see you all next week. Oh, I, I just want to actually add on to that, Mr. Chair. I, I do want to thank the board, everybody here uh, for this project, especially. I don't feel like I was able to give it quite as much attention as I really would have liked to. For something like this so I, I thank you guys you really you guys really stepped up and crushed this one because i'm like all right good i i can feel less bad about it we're here with uh here with a good group of people so i appreciate it we're just trying to everybody takes their turn carrying their weight and when you have something going on we want to carry it and help you out so we did that you've done it up for us enough times thank you mr, you. mr. chair you said or somebody said yeah you'd see us next week Oh, next meeting, not okay. next week. Okay. Next okay. meeting. Yep. Just to Although, yeah, that was a Freudian slip. I, I will miss you guys if I don't see you every week. But... <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all. All right. If there's nothing else, I would take a motion to adjourn. So much. So all right. <laughs> you two guys, get your ch you, you get the chance. Ms. Parks moves, Mr. Maxfield seconds the motion to adjourn until um, the next meeting on June 8th. Um, this is a non-debatable motion and it requires a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Marks Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. All right, we're adjourned. Thank you all. We'll see you in two weeks.